Hi everyone, my name is Ewan Kingston. I'm really excited to be part of this uh, really innovative and important conference. Uh, and I really look forward to uh, seeing your comments and, and questions after the talk. Now, we all know that humanity as a whole emits several billion tons of, of CO2 per year. And it's this extra forcing into the carbon cycle that's uh, pushing uh, temperatures up with all these terrible effects, uh, both uh, now and in the future. Uh, the difficulty comes sometimes in really elucidating exactly what is wrong with those individual acts that make up the collective act. There's a quite influential article by uh, Walterson and Armstrong who goes through all the different ways you might say that uh, one individual uh, joyride on in a gas guzzling car on a Sunday is, uh, you know, is, is morally wrong for that. And, and he shows some pretty good arguments why um, most of the easy ways he might try to say why that is wrong uh, fail. Now, this is just a bit of background here, um, that it's a difficulty within climate ethics. And what I'm proposing is not to deal with that difficulty head on, but to talk about another side to the issue that doesn't get talked about that much, and that's the aesthetic qualities of individual acts uh, that emit a large amount of greenhouse gases, um, particularly those acts which involve burning fossil fuels. And I want to argue that an act or an object that involves the burning of fossil fuels is, for that reason, less aesthetically valuable. It's uglier than uh, an alternative which is based on, on renewable energy or on natural sources of energy. And it's that connection with nature that I really want to bring out in this talk. So the first step in my argument has to be to try to show how nature itself is beautiful. And that itself would take up far more than, than one talk, but I just want to briefly sketch some of the reasons why some people have thought that uh, biological nature in particular is uh, inherently beautiful. So many of you might think it's just obvious that uh, nature is beautiful, that looking over a forest or a lake can let you see this directly. Uh, and I'm sympathetic to this kind of romantic view, but uh, also being a philosopher, part of my role is to try to provide arguments uh, where uh, someone else might not accept uh, our reports and our intuitions and our exhortations. One way to start in this is to uh, accept that sometimes the knowledge that we bring to bear when we're viewing an object or an event gives us insight into the aesthetic quality of that event. One example, which is one that Kenneth Walton gives, is that when we hear a collection of sounds uh, we might hear it as, as staccato, and it would have a certain emotional quality because of that, maybe a little reserved. Uh, but if we hear those sounds and we know something about uh, the instrument that's producing it, we know that it's a piano. Uh, those sounds, rather than being staccato, uh, actually start to sound rather lyrical. Even though a piano, the attack, the, the way the notes come out, is pretty staccato compared to a violin. We don't view a lyrically played piano piece as a staccato piece. We view it as a more lyrical piece. But if you're making the same sounds on a violin, that would be a staccato piece. And it would carry different emotional qualities and it would have different aesthetic qualities because of it. So uh, one thing that uh, people like Alan Carlson do is they try to show how when we apply this idea to nature, uh, we can see that, that biological nature and uh, ecosystems themselves are deeply beautiful. So the idea is that while there's uh, some animals like uh, parasitic wasps that lay their eggs inside caterpillars and the eggs hatch and the little baby wasps eat the caterpillars out from the inside, while these things might seem ugly from the outside, uh, while a naked mole rat might seem ugly if you just view it as an object, when you view it in terms of the, the process of 
evolution by, by natural filtration, uh, the fit of the organism to the, uh, to the niche that it occupies, and the way it has co-evolved with other organisms. Um, this brings out, and here I'm going to quote actually, Science reveals in, in nature order, regularity, harmony, balance, tension, and resolution. Um, and these things have aesthetic properties. Many would argue, and I want to uh, support um, the idea that seeing nature through the lens of science reveals its beauty. The next step is to pay attention how energy flows through natural biological systems. Uh, and the main thing I want to uh, highlight here is that energy flows through natural systems in a way in which the energy that is being used is energy that has entered the Earth's system very recently, at least on geological scale. So, to give an example, take the bird that's singing outside right now. It's eaten some berries, the berries had sugars in them, the chemical energy that was implanted in those sugars has to have been implanted there during the lifetime of the plant. So the plant, as you know, uh, harvests, harvests energy from the sun, so it's energy from outside the earth's system coming in, harvested by the plant, at some point in its life, transferred to sugars, uh, which reside in the berry, and the bird eats them. So while you know, even if this tree is, is several hundred years old, that energy is, is just seven, several hundred years old uh, in terms of when it ended the Earth system. So that kind of energy, I want to call fresh energy. Um, and most of it isn't going to be several hundred years old. It's going to be the leaves that were growing this spring uh, using energy that maybe fell on the plant the previous summer and was stored as, in, in the sap as sugars. The thing that's keeping everything going is new batches of fresh energy hitting the Earth's surface every moment. So I see this as, as a feature of nature, with very few exceptions, which we'll get to in a moment. What about our energy systems? Are we using fresh energy? We certainly aren't. Uh, by and large, in, in as much as our energy system is still hooked onto fossil fuels, it's using very, very old energy. For those of you who don't know, coal is the pressurized remains of forests that were standing hundreds of millions of years ago and got their energy from that uh, ancient sunlight. Uh, and petroleum is the pressurized remains of plankton and algae that received their energy hundreds of millions of years ago with sunlight falling on the ocean. So most of this energy hit the Earth's surface a very, very long time ago. And so this, I want to call stale energy. It's fundamentally different from the energy that's cycling through the natural system as we speak. So if nature is beautiful, then I think it follows that if you take a, any given object or any given act, if it is more similar to nature and everything else stays the same, then it's more beautiful. To me, this seems relatively un uncontroversial, as long as you bear in mind that I'm not saying that all things to be uh, judged aesthetically valuable have to be similar to those things in nature. No, I said all, all else being equal. What I'm arguing for is not an aesthetic which uh, says we should only use natural materials in terms of wood, uh, fiber, uh, natural fibers. It's not the case that the matter that goes through biological systems is all fresh matter. Um, the matter is stuff that's been here for a long, long time, and sometimes has been absorbed into the uh, into the lithosphere, into the rock. When we use recycled uh, metals and recycled plastics, we're really imitating nature. Uh, nature can keep recycling matter in loops, so it's the material uh, can be very, very old. Uh, but it's the energy that's driving it that's fresh in the natural system. So the thing that makes it difficult to say what's, uh, what's wrong, what's morally wrong with individual acts of burning fossil fuels or what could be wrong with them 
is that it's hard to say what difference they make in terms of global warming. Whether I go for a Sunday drive or not doesn't seem to affect uh, whether someone is going to be suffering from a particular uh, flood or drought in the future or whether a hurricane is going to be of enough strength to blow over an extra house or uh, anything like that. So it's hard to say what difference the individual act makes. And that's a problem for ethical theory. Not an insurmountable problem necessarily, uh, but a challenge. But you might remember at the start of the talk I said this is going to help us uh, look into this problem of uh, what we can say about individual acts of, of, of burning fossil fuels, or acts that are associated with higher amounts of fossil fuels. So my point here is that while it might be really hard to say what difference one of those acts makes, its aesthetic qualities are still affected. Even if my act of uh, burning fossil fuels uh, in a Sunday drive uh, makes no difference to the climate, it's still because of its distance from the natural paradigm, perhaps there's aesthetically valuable than riding a bike instead. Now this is easiest to see when we take two things which are actually for all other purposes identical. So imagine that this soda can was smelted using uh, fossil fuels and this can was smelted using power from wind, solar, already existing hydroelectricity, whatever you like. So all that I'm trying to say, really, is that even if it makes no difference whether I buy this can or this can in terms of uh, the amount of fossil fuels emitted at the end of it because it's just one purchase and that has to travel through this complex causal chain and there could be all these buffers and slack in the supply lines and everything like that. Even if it makes no difference in the end, this can, the one made with renewable energy, just is more beautiful, because it's more closer to nature. Maybe I want to pick the more beautiful can. Hey, haven't you forgotten about uh, hydrothermal vents? Uh, the black smokers, the biological communities that live in the deep sea? Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, the hydrothermal vents, uh, very hot water coming out of the, the, uh, the bottom of the sea, and it contains uh, compounds like hydrogen sulfide, and there's biological communities that have built up, and their main energy source isn't from the sun or from animals uh, that have once upon a time eaten something that got energy from the sun. Their main energy source is this hydrogen sulfide, um, and that itself is probably created by um, breaking down certain rocks and minerals. So this seems to be stale energy. So maybe I'm wrong in thinking that those actions and uh, objects that embody uh, fresh energy uh, from recent sunlight are more uh, beautiful because more natural um, than those that embody stale energy. Because even in biological nature, we find these systems uh, that perfectly well utilize this uh, ancient energy themselves, um, almost as if they were tapping into a coal seam like we do. If one looks at the amount of energy flowing through uh, the terrestrial ecosystems and the marine ecosystems that are based on, on energy from the sun, that it's just so much more vast than these black smokers. Um, so maybe if we really want to mimic nature, we could have a little bit of this stale energy, um, with a lot of our energy being fresh energy. And at the moment that's not what we've got, it's the other way around. So to wrap up, nature, biological nature in particular, is beautiful. One of the features of biological nature is that it almost always uses rather fresh energy in geological terms. Those things which we do, which are closer to nature, are, everything else considered, more beautiful. So, when we use stale energy to power our machines, to create objects, uh, to get somewhere, we're doing something that, because it's more removed from nature in that sense, it's less beautiful. So 
So finally, I just want to say thank you so much for listening to my talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I really look forward to your questions and comments. And uh, hope you have a great day. Get out there and enjoy some uh, renewable energy in one form or another.